It's 12 hours, and this is Nick Wilmot with the news summary. There could be more cuts in bus services in the Brighton area from May. A set of proposals by the Brighton Borough Transport Manager, Mr Richard Clark, will reduce services in outlying areas of the town. Ten years of news, weather reports, bus timetables, information for glasshouse growers, greyhound results, angling news, lost cats, record requests, sea conditions, church bells, and literally thousands of broadcasts by Brightonians for Brightonians. But has Radio Brighton achieved what it set out to do? A very fundamental question, one that I was faced with when I turned up for the very first time in 1978. I've been in the media all of my life in one way or another. My other claim to fame is that I'm the man you hear warning you to mind the gap on the London Underground. So what did I find on my arrival at Marlborough Place, the then HQ of the BBC in Brighton? Well, at that stage, a very professional radio station, an enormous range of programmes and doing an enormous amount with very few people compared with the London broadcasting that I knew with all the staff and resources there. I've been listening to your show on the radio And you seem like a friend to me Basically the sport And when my little, my youngest one was born um, We made a dedication okay, to the special to the care school. unit At the Sussex County Hospital We've had a lot of Radio Brighton Listeners' reaction to their local radio service And this was the difference that I discovered between the BBC in London and what BBC Radio Brighton and later BBC Sussex was pioneering. It was an awareness of what the listeners wanted out of their radio station, something which was very close to the late Ivan Howlett, first a reporter and then news editor on the radio station. Every new day means that people need to have their world blocked in for them, charted for them. And that's the function of early morning radio. And you've got to sort out this jumble. And also there are people's birthdays and there's the station identity in the sense of being a companion for people who are alone at home, who are sending greetings to people. That has to be incorporated. Now, how do you deal with an international story on the one hand and play a request for someone whose birthday it is on the other hand? That is the problem that has to be coped with because we do do that. Um, and it's part of everyone's world. Every morning when I get up, I put the radio on for Radio Brighton because we have to have the news on. I like to listen to the programmes, they're very interesting. I take the transistor on the beach, listen to the programmes on there. I've even got it on in the car on Radio Brighton. And also, uh, it's very interesting because we were down there one Saturday with the Red Arrows and there was the accident and we saw the pilot coming out of the kind of injector seat street. and uh, of course everyone's wondering what's happened I put the radio on and there's a news flash straight away and we heard what exactly had happened with a crash going near the palace pier and uh, it was all the whispers went up one way and the other way and uh, because yes it was so interesting you're on the spot but you can hear everything that's you know you can hear everything that's going on though you can't see it the crash of the two red arrows during a display along Brighton seafront was, of course, not just a local story, but a big national story. Another major national story was when the giant Greek merchant vessel, the Athena B, ran aground off the Palace Pier in Brighton. 20,000 people came down to see if it could be relaunched. There was thick fog and only the radio station could tell them what was happening. There was another national story which Radio Brighton had to deal with which was far more difficult. Ray Chandler at the time was a freelance reporter and he remembers the Maria Colwell case. This was a case of a, of a young lass who was being looked after supposedly by the family of her mother and stepfather and I'm afraid it's one of those cases which uh, at the time people said should never happen again uh, but as we know it has happened again. The girl was, was killed and uh, I covered both the event itself and the investigation afterwards and then the inquiry. There was a, a full public inquiry that followed. It was the first case of, of that nature which had been covered by uh, local radio anywhere. Certainly it stretched resources to some extent because the case went over about three weeks and um, the only way to cover it satisfactorily was to have somebody there all the time. 
Uh, I was there for the majority of the time, but clearly had to be helped by other people from time to time. One of the other people involved in reporting on the Maria Colwell case was Jeremy Paxman, now, of course, a face on television. But while he was at Radio Brighton, he put together a documentary on that very controversial case. She's been returned completely against her will, against all her protests, witnessed by many, many people, with over 30 recorded complaints being made. It's unbelievable that this cult could go on so long and the result could still be what it was. I mean, do you realise that if Keppel hadn't have killed her, she'd still be going through this now? That's if she hadn't died of a broken heart in the meantime? All the witnesses and counsel agree that Maria's death was a terrible tragedy. Many social workers feel that this inquiry, the only case of child cruelty ever to be subjected to this kind of scrutiny, could lead to big changes, not only in the organisation of welfare departments, but even perhaps in adoption and fostering laws. And there have already been demands for the introduction of compulsory sterilisation and mandatory removal of children from the home. Big changes may well be on the way. In the years to come, both for BBC Radio Brighton and then BBC Sussex, there were to be numerous other major stories like that, which were covered at length and in depth. For example, there was the so-called Babes in the Woods murders, the bodies of two nine-year-old girls, Nicola Fellows and Karen Hadaway, who were found in Wild Park Moorscombe on the outskirts of Brighton back in 1986. But there were some straightforward big good news stories to look at as well, for example, the opening of a large civic building. Barbara Long was the reporter. On October the 3rd, the Labour Party holds its annual conference here in Brighton. In the £9.5 million Brighton Centre, in fact. A building which Labour leader and Prime Minister James Callaghan opened only on Monday. Bud Evans was there. There may be controversy about Brighton's new centre, but all the political infighting was forgotten as the Prime Minister joined town and county dignitaries for the formal opening. Mr Callaghan was enthusiastic about the building when he saw it in the early days, and it's clearly even more so now. In effect, he was saying, didn't they do well? Yes, I think you have done well in this town. You have shown that you're ready to face the necessary changes and to make them, and this will ensure a great vigour and a new life uh, for this town of Brighton. Well, someone who came to Radio Brighton in the mid-1970s was David Arscott. He'd been in journalism, did a bit of mature studying, and then had his first taste of broadcasting at Radio Brighton. I think at that stage we were still feeling uh, it's a new medium, local radio. There are still things to be done. The radio car wasn't a new invention, but it was new enough to still go wrong often enough. David Arscott took on the challenge of developing our presence at the all-important county show at Ardingly. Programmes coming from there and, of course, all those facilities that were needed to keep us broadcasting. So there's nothing else we've got to do about Ardingly. I mean, I've done the display which, God willing, will be in. It sounds to me as though you've got to have an engineer there each day. Now you're sure. playing with all this. I think yeah, so. Right. Yeah. And the radio car, too. Yeah. And the radio car. So uh, why not pop in and give us uh, a call? But if you're not coming to Arling Live, then we'll be giving you information uh, throughout the three days on the Good Morning programme and on Saturday, on its Saturday, Saturday session with injects, as we like to call them, into other programmes. Well, the Arling Live show um, w was always tremendous fun, and uh, our part in it grew and grew. Gradually, over the years, we, we got got a, a better site, nearer and nearer the centre. And, of course, we got taken quite seriously. I mean, I think uh, we did our bit for the show as much as they did, as it were, for us. Both Keith Slade and David Arscott had a great fascination in people's memories, local history recorded by the people themselves. I was ten then, and my father had a butcher's business, and I had to do my chores Saturday mornings. I had a little old round. He had a bike with a basket in it. I couldn't ride their bike. I used to push it. And when I'd done that, I'd go home and get my dinner and come back up the shop and I'd have to out scrub then. I came to love the detail of Sussex, uh, the stories that people would tell about the good old days, people who remembered a long time back, and talking to historians who, who had really done their research. By and by, we, we, we came to dig out loads of, if you like, trivial as well as important stories about Sussex from the past, and it began to sort of form images in my head. I began to see the way the county had begun to take shape, and of course it got more and more enjoyable as time went. And I had the view that you could interview people uh, of any uh, depth of knowledge 
and make it interesting to people who knew very little about history. Uh, one thing I, I hated in the early days of local radio was people would say, well, we are local radio and our audiences are, uh, they say, the average housewife, as, uh, which I always thought was t a terrible denigration. Well, of course it was, uh, of women and housewives. Indeed, some of those housewives and many others from all walks of life came to become broadcasters on BBC Radio Brighton and BBC Sussex. Jim Parr had worked in the theatre, he came to Radio Brighton, and he eventually became programme organiser. You had an awful lot of the people who began as listeners got involved themselves and started to put forward ideas for programmes. There was only the door, the outside door, between us and the people outside. And they were frequently coming in, and people would be interviewed. I think... Radio Brighton, in fact, was one of the first stations, if not the first station, to do live Thought for the Day. And I remember Fred, the minister who came in to do it, actually coming in and running on for nearly five minutes when it was a two-minute spot, so we were very wary in the future about how long he took. But uh, that kind of thing, of course, was, was par for the course. Over the years, some very specialist programmes emerged from the local community. Gardening's always been a popular pastime with our listeners. These days, the weekly programme Dig It goes out on Sunday mornings. Well, the early shoots of that programme, so to speak, were formed on a programme called Gardener's Club, which came about as a result of a meeting of gardeners. The show was presented by Charles Bowen. It's arranged that one week will be done by a team from Brighton, the next week will be uh, run by a team from Worthing. We've been the length and breadth of the county, we've done a programme, recorded it, and... Uh, we use this phrase, the coastal strip. Well, if you're on the coastal strip, you've got to think a wee bit different to the chap living back farther in, up toward the Surrey border. You're listening to BBC Sussex at 30 with me, Ian Collington. A special look back at 30 years of BBC Sussex serving the county and the forerunner, BBC Radio Brighton. <laughs> Somebody who came in years ago in his spare time to do some broadcasting was Stuart McIntosh, then a telephone engineer, who eventually became a full-time presenter at the station. Being a Brighton lad, I was able to talk about all my the things I knew about Brighton, and you could really please the local audience. Being born in Beaconsfield Villas in Brighton, as I was, and playing in Preston Park and all those things, and going to school in Brighton. So it was quite handy for me. I think that was one of the qualities that the then manager, Bob Gunnell, saw in me. A lot of qualities he didn't see in me... <laughs> <laughs> like the fact that I used to play fast music and he didn't like that very much. I suppose I've been around a bit. I, as you know, I started off here just as you arrived, I was leaving. No no uh, reason to leave because you arrived, but I was just about to go off to Northern Ireland and uh, do a bit of time in Belfast as a current affairs producer, which was a great career move because uh, I was a station assistant in Brighton and they say that profits are never recognised in their own kingdom. I don't think I'd have moved on from that role if I hadn't gone away. Jim Parr pays tribute to someone who started with a radio station in his teens, mastering both the technical side and the broadcasting side. Piers Bishop is another person that leaps to mind. Piers, of course, was just quite an extraordinary person. He was a young man and uh, when I was first became aware of him on the station, uh, I could see that he was very, very clever. And, of course, as you know, he was on the early morning show for months and months and months without end. As a broadcaster, he was extremely fine. This is Good Morning Sussex. Good morning to you from Piers Bishop. Weekdays from half past six, normally to 8.45, though we don't know precisely what's going to happen this morning. It'll depend on the news of the morning. This was the day back in 1984 of the bombing of the Grand Hotel in Brighton. A summary now at half past eight. Radio Sussex News headlines. This is Richard Linfield. Firemen are digging through the rubble at the Grand Hotel on Brighton Seafront for another body after an explosion which destroyed three floors of the hotel earlier this morning. Two people have already been reported as dead. 24 are injured. As a pale dawn breaks over the seafront, more details have been emerging about the extent of the damage to the building. The bomb went off on the fourth or fifth floor. Mrs Thatcher was staying in the Napoleon suite on the first floor. But immediately after the explosion, a huge column of rubble fell through the centre of the hotel. It seems there's now a hole from the ground floor clean through to the roof. The front of the building has been ripped open from the fourth floor upwards and there's now a gaping hole in the Grand's facade. Debris was thrown right across the seafront down to the water's edge. Immediately after the explosion, there was considerable confusion with the hotel's residents, many of them in pyjamas, wandering around dazed and bewildered. 
Max Pearson reporting there.